Well, spooky season is upon us, and I could not be happier. I've already put up my giant spider and spider web, my fractal skeletons, my yard flamingulas, and I'm ready to greet the neighborhood's trick-or-treaters with a big bowl of rainbow fentanyl. Mmm, that's right. I went all out this year, and I spent $750,000 on this small bowl of drugs that I plan to give out for free to small children who will eat them and then surely die. For, you know, reasons. Mmm, death candy. This Halloween life hack would never have occurred to me had I not seen this very professional public service announcement from America's greatest political leaders. Hi, I'm Senator Dr. Roger Marshall. I come to you today not only as a United States Senator, but as a fellow American concerned about the health of our nation's youth this Halloween. The powerful drug cartels are coming after your kids, your neighbors, your students, your family members, and your friends. Fake pills laced with fentanyl are beginning to look like candy in an effort to lure young Americans. Rainbow fentanyl comes in a variety of bright colors, shapes, and sizes, including pills, powders, and blocks that resemble sidewalk chalk. According to the DEA, these pills are a deliberate effort by drug traffickers to drive addiction amongst kids and young adults. Even just handling these pills or powders masquerading as candy can kill a person. All it takes is one pill or enough powder to fit on the tip of a pencil to poison and kill someone. This Halloween, Let's join forces and look out for one another. Only let kids get candy from trusted neighbors, family, and friends. Set a curfew for your trick-or-treaters. Always double and triple check their candy for drugs or suspiciously packaged or unpackaged items. And remind kids to trick or treat in groups and to check in with parents periodically. Because by working together and being on high alert this Halloween, we can help put an end to the drug traffickers that are driving addiction and poisoning our neighbors and children. Okay, real talk. I've never tried fentanyl and don't know anyone that has, but I'm pretty sure that one of the warning signs of a fentanyl user is acting the way Louisiana Senator Bill Cassidy is acting in this PSA. Okay, so first of all, fentanyl is an extremely strong synthetic opioid that is sold as is sometimes for pain relief, uh, including through prescriptions. Um, it's also sold on the street, and it's also sold sometimes to beef up or even completely replace pricier drugs like heroin, which can lead to overdoses because it's like 50 times more potent than heroin. Like, just check out this chart from the National Institutes of Health showing that Fentanyl deaths have absolutely gone through the roof in the past few years. It really is a problem. Like most popular street drugs, fentanyl now comes in a variety of fun colors, which led the U.S. Drug Enforcement Agency to issue this statement at the end of this summer, warning that rainbow fentanyl is a new trend used by drug cartels to sell highly addictive and potentially deadly fentanyl made to look like candy to children and young people. That is just uh, really stupid because, you know, a gram of fentanyl currently goes for about $150. Um, literally, no one who sells drugs for a living wants to give those drugs away for free to literal children. Like, no, the average 10-year-old isn't going to fall for the old, the first one is free and then you get them hooked scam because when the 10-year-old gets addicted and comes around for a second hit, he isn't going to have $100 to spend. He had $10, but he spent it on an insane clown posse skin for Fortnite. So sorry, none left over for fentanyl. So why are dealers selling colorful fentanyl? Because it's good marketing, probably, <laughs> you know, like, yes, children do love bright colors, but you know who else does? Literally every fucking one else. <laughs> 
Like dealers use colors and symbols and cartoon characters to distinguish their product from everybody else's. They've been doing this for ages. Check out these incredible works of art, for instance, from LSD dealers in the 1970s and beyond. They didn't do it to appeal to little kids. They did it to let the customer know where their acid was coming from and also because it looked fucking awesome. The rainbow fentanyl Halloween freak out isn't a new phenomenon, of course. The past few years have seen a noticeable increase in parents and local news anchors losing their minds over cannabis edibles, which, yes, do look and kind of taste like delicious candy and chocolate and cookies. So as more states have been legalizing it, we've been seeing more hand wringing over it. Uh, but here's the thing. Those drugs cost me a lot of money. <laughs> I'm not going to give them away to children who aren't even going to appreciate them. Like the absolute worst that could happen is if I get so high, I mix up my cannabis peanut butter cup with the regular peanut butter cups, I fail to notice, I give it to a kid, and then that kid eats it and then gets couch locked for a few hours. We would both be pretty annoyed by it, I assure you. But of course, the cannabis edible Halloween scare also isn't new. Uh, people have been freaking out about weirdos drugging trick-or-treaters for decades now. In the 1960s, it was just straight up poison that people were worried about. Uh, not dealers trying to hook kids on drugs, but psychopaths actually trying to murder children which frankly does make more sense, I guess. While no child has ever died from poisoned Halloween candy given to them by a stranger or a neighbor, something really creepy did happen in 1974. That Halloween, Ronald Clark O'Brien took his son and daughter trick-or-treating along with a neighbor and the neighbor's two kids. The kids knocked on the door of a house where no one answered, and figuring no one was home, the kids and the neighbor went on to the next house. O'Brien lagged behind, and when he caught up to them, he claimed that someone actually did come to the door and that he got five pixie sticks from them. If you're not aware, pixie sticks are basically just straws filled with flavored sugar. Actually, I don't even know if there's a flavor other than sugar. I don't know. I used to love them, though. Uh, but in this case, those straws were partially filled with cyanide. O'Brien's son ate it and died, and luckily, the other kids who got the candy didn't eat them. In fact, O'Brien gave one candy to a 10-year-old that he knew from church, and when that kid's parents heard about the poisoning, they ran to his room to find him asleep holding the unopened pixie stick, having been unable to remove the staple to eat it. It turns out that O'Brien had taken out life insurance policies on his children, and he was looking to off them. And he gave out the other pixie sticks to cover up his actions, claiming, you know, it was just a random neighbor who gave them out. It didn't work. He was arrested a few days later. He was convicted by the following summer, and he was actually executed in 1984. The idea of poisoned Halloween candy got another boost in 1982. That October, the general public became aware of a series of deaths in the Chicago area that were all traced back to bottles of Tylenol, which had been laced with cyanide and placed back on the shelves to be sold to random people. Seven people died, and the killer was actually never found. Fun bonus fact, adding cyanide to Tylenol only makes it slightly more likely to kill you. Seriously, uh, acetaminophen is a trash drug that performs about the same as a placebo and is responsible for about 500 deaths a year in the United States alone. Anyway, uh, that Halloween, candy sales plummeted and people were terrified that their kids were going to be killed by cyanide-laced candy. So yeah, while there are sociopaths out there who have attempted and sometimes succeeded in murdering people by poisoning things that people think are going to be safe, no child has actually been killed uh, by a stranger handing out Halloween candy. And just for the record, that includes 
uh, candy or apples that are filled with razor blades or needles, even though those objects are easier for the average psychopath to get their hands on compared to cyanide. Sociologist Joel Best at the University of Delaware has studied Halloween sadism as an urban legend for decades now, and he's found no evidence of strangers putting sharp objects in candy and handing them out to trick-or-treaters. What he did find uh, were scenarios that were either kids pranking other kids without really thinking it through, or people purposefully putting objects into their own candy in order to get attention or to possibly win a lawsuit. And in all of those cases, no one has ever died or even been more seriously injured than needing a few stitches. I mean, the thought of it still makes me shudder, but... Yeah, no, no deaths or serious injuries. And let's be honest, you know, that shudder, that is what Halloween is all about, right? Like getting all freaked out about something. And over the years, our most popular horror movies and urban legends might help tell us about what we as a society are most truly afraid of in that time. So sexuality, communists, forced pregnancy, white supremacy, mental illness, Sociopaths that poison trick-or-treaters is clearly a classic we return to, possibly because it speaks to a society in decline where we feel disconnected from one another, where we don't necessarily know our own neighbors and what secrets they may be hiding. Rainbow fentanyl, like cannabis edibles before it, may speak to our fears about addiction in a society that shuns addicts as degenerate others who are in their situation because of their own inherent badness. Of course, those addicts would then reach out to snatch away our children's very innocence. That's how you make new addicts if you don't have enough just inherently bad people. It's all really interesting, and while I love exploring the underpinnings of a good urban legend, let's not forget the true scary story here. More than 50,000 people died by overdosing on fentanyl in 2020 in the U.S., and we can stop that number from continuing to rise with sensible public health policies like destigmatize addiction, make treatment a part of mainstream medicine, provide comprehensive health care to people who need it, everyone provide treatment instead of incarceration for addicts, and train more people, police officers, health professionals, and the general public how to identify and treat overdoses. For instance, naloxone is an opioid antagonist, meaning that it's a drug that almost immediately temporarily reverses the effects of an opioid overdose. It can buy a person enough time to get to a hospital and get longer-term treatment meaning that it can really truly save a life. And it won't hurt a person if they're ODing on some other drug, meaning that you can use it even if you're not sure that the problem is an opioid. And you, yes, you, uh, may be able to get naloxone at your local pharmacy without a prescription. You may even be able to get it mailed to you. Uh, You can go to nextdistro.org to find the best way to get it in your area. It's small enough to toss in your purse and important enough that should you ever need it, you can become someone's real life, not just for Halloween superhero. That's uh, that's all for this video, guys. But I did want to close with a sincere thank you to all of my patrons. For some reason, last month, YouTube decided to demonetize several of my videos, meaning that the only way that I can afford to keep making these videos videos is because of the kind-hearted people who have pledged to chip in for each video I make. Uh, Patrons get most of my videos early and ad-free now. Plus, depending on what level they sign up for, they can also get monthly live stream Q&As, weekly newsletters, and even an annual December holiday card. So please head to patreon.com slash Rebecca if you would like to join in on the fun. But regardless, I want to thank you so much for watching, liking, commenting, and subscribing.